Hello, I'm Olena Balko, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Eastern Europe's Minorities in a Century of Change, a podcast on the history of minority experiences in Central and Eastern Europe during the 20th century. This series is part of the Institute of Historical Research Centennial Commemorations, Our Century, Looking Back, Thinking Forward, and has been organized by the Study Group for Minority History. It was made possible through the help and support of the British Association of Slavonic and East European Studies. The study group is a forum devoted to researching minorities in the national and regional histories of Central, Eastern and Southeast Europe and promoting closer scholarly collaborations. For more information, please visit our website at studygroupforminorityhistories.com. On this episode, Raúl Karstocha at Nus University is talking to Mark Levine at the University of Southampton. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Olena. And thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, Mark. It's, it's really an honor for me to get to ask some questions uh, to someone who has been a major formative intellectual influence for me. Um, I'll start from your landmark two volume work, uh, The Crisis of Genocide, where you famously refer to an area roughly corresponding to Central and Eastern Europe as the Rimlands. And um, you analyze the dynamics of violence and ultimately genocide in that area through the lens of world systems theory. Could you tell us a bit about what exactly it is that renders this area distinct and which were the key elements that made this area especially violent in the course of the 20th century? In short, why there and why then? Mm, thank you, Ro. That's a big question indeed. Um... And it's interesting, um, I, maybe I can come back to the world system theory. And I, I think there are some sort of, there are, there are various components here, which um, I had to piece together to arrive at what it was I was talking about and why this particular bit of um, European and I should say extra European geography was pieced together in the way it was. I think there are, there, there's a first sort of um, group of things which, which, which makes this then. In other words, the first, the first part of the 20th century is significant, but I'm not excluding, but there are, there, are, there are aftershocks as well. And I do see this in some way as, I, I, do, I did use in the book geological metaphors to try and explain how we might look at this. But I think there's three political elements to um, what I'm talking about. W one is the one which has been, um, is best known, I suppose, in terms of how Tim Timothy Snyder has read it. You know, these two great revisionist empires um, after, well, you know, should we call them empires, post-imperial constructions, Germany as it becomes Nazi and uh, Russia as it becomes Soviet Stalinist. And they are the sort of the, the big players in the field. And I think one of the problems with um, looking at it through that prism is that you'd be forgiven for uh, assuming that there aren't any other players in the the grinding up, the destruction of groups who are um, are, are caught up in this uh, in this arena, and of course I also don't agree with the, the the arena itself. I think the arena is much is much larger than that, and should include um, a, a southern Ottoman arena. And so, really, my my first point of departure is really we're talking about the Austrian, Ottoman and Russian empires, primarily, um, which in a very particular, in historical terms, a very short period of time become shutter zones, they collapse. But actually the second part of this is that they are initially, to a significant extent, not filled by what becomes the Bolshevik stroke Stalinist state on the one hand, though, of course, that is there as a survival to the czarist collapse, or 
to uh, post Wilhelmine Germany, they are filled by national states. And, you know, the gobbling up in the first instance is done by these new states who elsewhere I, I refer to a, a, a name which was often used, the New Europe. Um, and so that is a second component. And then the third component, and you can see that what I'm doing here is on one level being very geopolitical, there is a third element, which is the hegemonic order, which is still there, which is the victory order after the First World War, the liberal West, and its role in the creation of the new Europe, but also its imperatives in relation to this significant semi-peripheral, or rather, I, I'm, I'll come back to that because, of course, when I talk about the Rimlands, I'm not precisely talking about the semi-periphery itself, but part of that semi-periphery, or more precisely, let's try and be a bit more precise, I'm talking about the zone in which the, and this is, it comes on to my second point, the um, the historic metropolitan advanced states of Western Europe come up against the imperial states of the East. And that carries with it all sorts of things about the nature of how we see modernization, progress, all that sort of stuff as it impacts upon, to use that Valestinian term, the semi-periphery of the empires, but in a, an exact zone, which is on the rim between those two, right? So we have an issue of modernity versus tradition, or if you want to use a much more, um, a much more problematic way of looking at it, progress versus backwardness. But in, but the, and here's the crunch, an area which happens to be polycultural, polylinguistic, and therefore in my mind, wonderful. It's, 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 ethno, ethno, it's, it's ethnographic diversity and cultural distinctiveness, which is the very thing which makes it very interesting. Yet, here's the point, what's the volume, the two volumes, what are they about? They're about the obliteration of all of that, or nearly all of that. I mean, it's still there, or there are resonance of it, of it there, but the argument is that actually those three great geopolitical forces, Russia, Germany, revisionist powers, liberal West, and the nationalities between them, they destroy all this. And in a, the, the, his, the historical question is, why, how, what, how, why, how, and as you say, what and when, you know, and, um, and I suppose, you know, there's a, the sort of the non-historical question is, it, did it have to be like that? Was this trajectory something which was preordained, which was built into the nature of things, or was the advent of first the Balkan Wars and then the First World War, was this the explosion which should never have happened? Question mark. Now I've gone over it, I've gone over it rather too long there, haven't I, Roald? But it's it's a it's as you yourself would say, it's a complex picture. Thank you very much, Mark. I mean you you have already answered my, my uh, another question I had about the uniqueness of this part of the semi-periphery if we are to think in, in uh, world systems uh, terms. But I'm still wondering, since you've mentioned uh, both uh, you know, peripheral European and extra-European geography, if we could gain something in terms of a vantage point by positioning the, the Rimland in a global context, mm -hmm. by comparing them to other semi-peripheral areas, if indeed, I mean, they don't have to be the same, the per se, if it doesn't have to be homogenous, but I still think there might be something to gain if we place them in a, in a broader context, if we look at them in a global, through a global lens. 
right? Well, that's again, it's a big question because you're asking both of us to think not just in Eastern European or as I have tried to do here in um, Eastern European rimlands, meaning, meaning also the Caucasus and the Crimea and uh, Anatolia. You're trying, you're, you're proposing the question, how do we see this in, a, in, a, in global terms? Now, you know, when you, when you sent me the questions, I thought, oh, that's interesting. Uh, my first response was, I don't know that I can answer that. But then I was thinking of the conference I've just been to. And I happen to have been for the first conference in over two years where I've been at something as a result of COVID and all that. I've just been at a conference on uh, what is happening in the Uyghur Autonomous Zone region in, um, in Xinjiang, in China. And I thought, well, actually, there are, there are some things which we have in common here about, you know, we, but we'd have to extend it way across from uh, a European frame of reference, right the way across to um, a, uh, a Central Asian frame of reference. But actually, some of what's interesting about it, and I, I gave a talk on, 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 you know, almost off the cuff, in which I said, look, the interesting thing about this, this um, part of the world is that if we were to look at it in its own terms, um, it was a, a, a very rich, ethnographically diverse and very different part of the world, um, made up of, uh, of not just agriculturalists, an oasis um, uh, cultures, but also pastoralists and nomads. And what's so interesting about that environment, if we were to look at it writ large, is how this very ethnographically diverse set of cultures, and with them the economies which went with them, because I think we're always in danger when we look at cultures of thinking, oh, they're nice things which people, you know, which people, which people have but we don't, we don't relate them to their economic base, but actually they're based on ways of being, ways of living. But if we think of the, that area, what has been happening in the last 200 years, but again, in an accelerated form um, in the, um, in, from the, from the, particularly in the, in the communist period in both um, the Soviet Stalinist case and the Chinese case, is that these regions have been gobbled up and transformed and in quotes modernized and once again you have groups of people today the Uyghurs being the, an, an extraordinary example of this who are being gobbled up and either assimilated in a very unpleasant forcible fashion to become part of the Chinese whole or um, as happened in the Soviet case they are they are vomited out. They are vomited out into some other part of the of the the great expanse. You know, and this this has always been an, an aspect of um, of genocidal action. Where instead of actually directly killing people, where can we vomit out? Where can we dump people who we don't want in our in our nice, perfect, ordered society? Where can we dump problematic populations? And I think actually, you know what. What happens in the uh, Rimlands context in Europe can be seen in parallel, for instance, not in exactly in the same chronology, because when we're talking about the Uyghurs, we are talking about a very definite now, but nevertheless, we can see the same processes, the same modernizing processes. And this is why I don't treat genocide Alas, as aberration, I, I treat it as a byproduct of the sort of development, the sort of trajectory which has been happening in modern times. And here we see other cases of it in, uh, as I'm proposing, as, as is happening to the Uyghurs, but has happened to lots of other people in that part of the world, in, in this big, what, what Halford McKinsey called the heartland became the hinterland of Soviet and Chinese empires. Now, I don't know if that answers it, but it's, it's, it's an, an, an example of how we might look at this. Oh, thank you. It absolutely does. I think it's a very, very interesting comparison across both space and time. 
um, and I think it does come to show, as you argue in the in uh, in the crisis of genocide, how modernization indeed is very much linked into this. And modernization, as we know, does proceed uh, in very uneven fashion if we are to follow a Palestinian paradigm. And I think this unevenness also translates into why different parts of the semi-periphery are different and and proceed at different with different chronologies. But what I would like to do now is to turn the lens from the outside, from comparing the Rimlands with other regions, back inside out to the Rimlands themselves. Because the Rimlands cover quite a large geographical area with significant cultural and political variations within, which are related to different imperial legacies. I mean, the three empires you mentioned earlier, actually four, if we also include the German, with the Habsburg, the Ottoman, and the Romanov, were quite different from one another, right? And there are also different patterns of nation state formation. There are different chronologies of, of achieving statehood. All of these impacted on minority groups in the region. So turning to the title of this podcast series, to what extent can we even speak of a coherent notion of minorities in Eastern Europe? Isn't the diversity of the groups covered, doubled by the different types of states, political regimes, and so on, too significant to be able to speak of minorities in Eastern Europe generally? Or was it precisely this diversity, which, as you mentioned earlier, was the norm in the region that sets the Rimland somehow apart from other places? Okay, well, I suppose it's a simple answer and, a, uh, and, <laughs> and the inevitably more complex answer. The simple answer is to veer towards the second suggestion of what you, of what you, you said. Um, but uh, it is, there, is a, there are similarities um, but there are similarities, I suppose, in the, in, the, in the very nature of difference. Now, what I should say, the, the, the thing I would have to personally say here is I don't buy into the notion of minorities at all. This is a modern construction, um, you know, which, and which we have come to take, like so many things in life, to be the norm. You know, there, is, there are in societies majority groups who are this, and then there are odd backward, problematic, difficult groups of people who are minorities. I don't buy that at all. I think it's, it's a load of nonsense, personally. But that's the way things have become normalised. It's now conventional wisdom, and it's there in all the EU reports and the uh, OSCE reports to talk about minorities as if they are these strange, uh, anomalous groupings. Now, if we were to sort of go back in time and to sort of look at how these societies operated, nobody spoke about minorities. They, they we might speak, and you know, if you, asked, um, if you asked somebody from a particular zone, you know, what are you? Who are you? They'd say, well, I'm from here. And you know, and and I'm or, and I'm orthodox, or I'm you know, or I'm uniate, or whatever. And then you know, they build their sense of who they were up from the grassroots to you know their who, who they are in terms of family, you know, their their immediate uh, cognitive map of what is around them. Then they build in religion. There wouldn't be this. This is this is the world of na national majorities which have created this notion. You know, and in a way, it's, it's, it's the most extraordinary trick which has been play, played on us all, that we, we take ourselves to be either part of this or, in some sense, anomalous. Now, the, well, I suppose what's interesting about the period of time which I'm trying to describe, it's in this period time frame that minor, the term minority is essentially created the minorities themselves become anomalous in relation to a nation state system which is over a period um, has become universalized it is this it is the standard global norm but in the period we're talking about was if you like the protean um, testing ground for this difference between majority and minority Does that answer the question? So oh yes, oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the, I, I completely agree with you. And I think this is, 
to some extent related to this inscription of the nation state as the standard, as the normative uh, form of state organization, which very much happens, like you say, at a specific point in time, uh, i.e. at the end of the First World War and the Paris Peace Conference, with the notion of self-determination being made sort of uh, to reign supreme over all other forms of state organization, although we know in practice this is not the case because there's, there's, there are still the mandates which um, do not really fit within this normative understanding of self-determination. But beyond that, you've also written extensively on the Paris Peace Conference and on the minority treaties. And it's interesting when you talk about the, the creation of the category of minority, because for the most part, the minority treaties applies to the area of the so-called successor states that, yeah. that you've mentioned earlier, that replaced the Central and East European empires that had collapsed. So consequently, would you say there is a specific East European dimension to the very concept of minority as it came to be defined legally at Versailles, or is the specific form that notion of minority rights took? So to turn the previous question again around, do, does this legal understanding of what a minority is in, in sort of like as a deviation, as you said, from the, the, the normative majority itself have an East European dimension? Have East, has, does, does it have East European roots? And is it grounded in the reality of Eastern Europe as it was at the time of the Paris Peace Conference? Well, again, I think the short answer is yes. <laughs> the long answer goes on for hours, probably. But let's try and sort of I think the, it's interesting, you know, how um, I came to sort of study minority rights for a partic particular prism, and it is interesting that we haven't we haven't developed that one yet, which is the word Jewish, um, you know, because it this plays such a critical role in the whole creation of the minorities treaties, and I do wonder whether there would have been a minorities treaties at all if there hadn't have been a Jewish. Component. I mean, there are other components. There's a, clearly a German component. But, you know, the more, when I actually studied, this was, you know, something I actually studied at the, in the archives and at the, at the cold face, as it were, one can't help but be struck by, the, by how much this was done on the hoof. And it wasn't, it wasn't some incredibly thought out process. And the people who actually come to, to determine, who actually are the the drafters and the the builders of the um the, the minorities aspects of versailles um are not particularly well tutored in what they're doing and they're reliant on a group of backroom experts like lewis namia um as an as a classic example or, or seaton watson these people who you know who do know something about these parts of the world um, you know, there's a very famous quote about Robert Cecil, who is many, one of these, you know, architects, um, you know, being shown a map of Austria-Hungary and commenting how peculiar it looks, you know, and he, he hasn't really got, a, you know, a grasp of, of what is at stake here. Um, the minorities treaties are, I think, a, to some extent, a provisional formula as devised by Western liberal politicians with quite hazy notions, with some very pragmatic considerations in mind about the stability of Eastern Europe. But nevertheless, their view of minorities is we will create this framework, but it is essentially a provisional framework, and hopefully at some stage it will go away. And everybody in Poland, as the classic, you know, Poland is the classic sort of testing ground of this. We're going to create a model treaty and it's going to be Poland. And we're going to create this treaty within the next 20 days. I mean, because that's how it was. They, you know, the Wilson and Clemenceau and Lloyd George, they handed down this remit, go away and do this. So these guys had to do it. And then they were dependent and were listening where they could to various other people, like the guy I bring into play, a man called Lucian Wolf, who in turn is dependent on a man called David Moshevich, who is somebody who is from the Russian Empire, the deceased Russian Empire, and actually knows something about this. Um, and he does. And so it's that amalgam which produces this. But the more one looks at it, the more, this is a very 
it is rather flimsy, I have to say, but and it, and it is a response to a particular moment in time when there is this huge anxiety, particularly about Jews, because one has to relate it across to the Jews. There's something to do with the Bolsheviks in 1919. This is part of the, you know, and are they going to run rampant over, you know, what we're doing? We've got to keep them in their place somehow. We've got to shut them up and give them something. And there is this sort of, I mean, it's, it's very peculiar. And the same is true to some extent of the Germans in um, in Poland as well. We have to, you know, these Germans in Silesia, are they going, is it going to be the basis of irredentism? No, we have to give them some sort of cultural autonomy and rights. And it, it's not very well thought through. The assumption is that the Ukrainians, um, uh, uh, for example, or the Lithuanians in Poland are somehow going to be absorbed into the Polish state and it will be all right. And we know what happens with that, you know. This is another disaster zone, basically. Um, but there, there we have it. So yeah, the answer, to come back to the original question, is yes, it does have very much to do with the successor states of Eastern Europe. And from that, we get the crystallization of this notion of minorities. And also with it, alas, the notion that minority rights are a problematic thing. They, at, the end of the second, at the end of the Second World War, the whole thing is dumped, you know, um, because actually we don't want to be doing this and it doesn't work. That's the sort of assumption. Yeah, indeed. That's that's very interesting, and uh, it's it's also links into something that's been bothering me ever since I've been working on minorities myself. I.e., that yes, they they definitely appear compromised after 1945, and they they become replaced by the new human rights regime, but then they make a comeback. So in the 1990s, we see a renewed interest in minority protection in minority rights. Um, and the context can be once again seen as one of collapse. Yeah. This time it's not the empires, but the socialist bloc. And, but the primary area of concern for the new minority protection is once again Central and Eastern Europe. So returning to the previous question, you know, do you think, when we, when we think of minority legislation today, do you think uh, you know, we can speak again of a connection between the area of Central and Eastern Europe and notions of what the minority represents? And is there any continuity, perhaps, with the 1919 minority treaties? Or is the, you know, the, the post-1990 uh, minority legislation something completely new? And if there is a continuity with the minority treaties, is it still suitable to the present-day challenges that minorities face in Central and Eastern Europe and elsewhere? Well, that's interesting. I think I'd like to hear your view, as you're, you're in a sense, more, a lot more contemporary in terms of what you deal with, to, to some extent, than me. Um, I think, you know, a sort of provision, provisional set of answers. I think it's interesting that, as I said earlier, but the, uh, that there are aftershocks to what happens in the period 1919 19 to 23 and then 38 to 45 say um in what happens in parts of the rimlands immediately after the collapse of the soviet union and you get you know with, there are various commentators who have remarked on this but these are the tension these are the you know the tectonic plates are sort of again they're they're shifting and it's interesting where those you know, those, uh, those elements are, you know, in Nagorno karabakh in Georgia, uh, Georgia, uh, Georgia and Armenia, uh, the wars which are there, we tend to forget those. Obviously, we, we remember most obviously the ones in, um, in Bosnia-Herzegovina and, uh, and in, in that part of the Balkans. And, you know, um, it's sort of, um, it's interesting, isn't it? But it's almost like these are the uh, the continuation of what I'd call the wars of Ottoman succession. They're not just the wars of the Yugoslav succession. They, they have some resonance of, un, of, if you looked at it through the modernist lens, of unfinished business. You know, and, you know, if you read people like Brailsford and Buxton back in the early 1900s, they say, well, what are all these people doing mixed up together? You know, these people should be here and those people should be here and they shouldn't be living it. It's not going to work. 
and you think, well, these people are mad, you know, because they've lived like this for hundreds of years. What's the problem? But in a sense, I think we have a continuation of that. And again, I think, you know, again, the way the West responded to some of these crises, you know, I always think about um, Owen Vance, for instance, the, um, you know, the, the first attempt at dealing with Bo Bosnia, Bosnia Herzegovina is, oh, oh, well, well, except but what the Serbs have done, ethnic cleansing is basically, it's done, we can't change it. So well, you know, well, well, create a cantonal system which basically accepts it. And this is actually the Western, you know, the Western view all along is when it comes to my, you know, we only have to go back to Lausanne in 1923, which is which is the classic model imprimatur of ethnic cleansing. Yes, well, we didn't like it, but we accept it, and it and it creates a a, a, a coherent national system. So. <coughs> Yes, I think there is there is elements of continuity, particularly in relation to to that period. That those sort of you know we've got three twentieth century <coughs> seismic moments of collapse in the first world war arena, the, the second world war and aftermath and arena, and then this cl <coughs> cl um, collapse of the Soviet and Yugoslav systems. <laughs> which produces very, very similar results. Now, whether, minor, whether there is continuation in terms of minority rights thinking, I really don't know, because I think the problem is that the <coughs> minority rights system was so disgraced at the end of the Second World War and so forgotten about. I mean, nobody talks about, um, you know, the Austro-Marxists who had, came up with their own. To my... To my view rather uh, not perfect uh, not, not perfect but an attempt to look at the world laterally to, in different terms and you know to, to skip all this notion about nation and state being joined together at the hip and the arm and everything else but actually you could find a different way of creating a modus vivendi at operandi between peoples i don't think any of that has really come back into uh, OSCE or e European Union thinking it's 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 much more processual isn't it and actually uh, the other thing I was actually looking because when you gave me these questions I thought well I don't really know what is actually in the substance of minority rights um, in what has been declared since 1992 for instance and when I looked at it, it there isn't a lot. It's it's sort of it's 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 a sort of it, it's more of that sort of wishy washy. Yes, there should be people's minority rights should be protected, but it, there's not a lot of substance as far as I can see. To, is that fair, Raoul? In terms of how you would look at it, it's there's no there's no basis to which says you know that people should have cultural autonomy or they should or they you know because actually I think the other thing I would say is as I said right at the beginning minority if we look at some of the minorities we tend to forget about take a group like the Lemkos in um, in Poland you know their their relation their, it's not their culture is based on on their pastoralist num, quasi transhuman existence and nobody is going to offer anybody in the world today a return to this I mean, the nearest thing I can think of in the European context is the Sami, you know, and the Sami, you know, oh, well, we have to be nice to the Sami because, you know, there might be some, you know, some um, um, first world people out there who might start complaining if we start sort of, you know, slaughtering reindeer herds or something, you know, um, but it's, 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 um, it's a sort of, let's be nice to the minorities as long as they behave like everybody else, basically. That's the way, I mean, that's, I know it's rather cynical, but again, it's this, it's really, you can be minorities, you can be anything you like, as long as you're part of the flat, same time, space, dimension, which is everybody else. Is that fair or is that total cynicism? No, I think that's, I mean, from, from what I know myself about the post-1990 uh, minority protection system, I think it's it's absolutely fair. And I think that's where I see the, actually myself a continuity with minority treaties. 
because they were made, uh, in, in the words of an interwar commenter, to, to, to protect the states against the minorities more than minorities from the state. Yeah. Uh, there was Alfred Coburn, I think, who said that. Um, yeah. And I think that the, the way I see it, the, the post-1990 system was very much designed with a view to prevent conflict. To sort of and prevent conflict from spreading to Western Europe, which was the big fear. I mean, if it stays contained there, fine. But if it goes on for too long, it might spread, and we might get refugees, and we don't want that. So it's, it is a very cynical system, I think. And when you look at the at the, at the policy made with regards to minorities, I think it's all very much geared to conflict prevention, and therefore, if it benefits minorities or not, or if even if it fits minorities or not. It's, it's less of a matter. And also, it doesn't look at differences between minorities. Because people like Sami, a, a community like the Roma, and a community like Germans, have very different needs. Yeah. <laughs> and, and would need to be treated sort of like very, very differently. The Sami, to some extent, are because they fall, fall under indigenous peoples rather than minorities. But uh, when it comes to Europe's minorities, between you know Frisians, um, Poles, Lelemkos, and, and Roma, there's a, there's a world of difference, yeah. but they are all minorities, and therefore, in order to fit them all in this umbrella, the rights have to be, like you said, thin. They have to be sort of reduced to minimum formalistic rights, if you want. Um, so yeah, I, I, I very much agree with you there. And since we brought the discussion to the present, in, in recent years, you have turned your attention to the climate crisis and have analyzed this in relationship to the potential for violence in the 21st century. So. To what extent does the unprecedented nature of the current climate catastrophe affect minority groups? Well, that's a difficult question because in a way I don't know what the precise answer is because I'd say I think my immediate reaction, and it follows on from some of the things you've just been saying, Raul, are that the, the zone of conflict has, has shifted it's and you know i would say i mean it's interesting that you mentioned roma the roma remain as the sort of the um the big anomalous question mark don't they in sort of european terms of oh well, they don't fit we 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 can't we can't do what the nazis did to them or the romanians did try to do to them in the second world war you know we have to accept them but they are they are in a sense the nearest thing i think i would um, proffer in relation to where I think the, um, the, the the zone of conflict is now and the term I would use and you use the word indigenous is frontline communities I would go very much more for that because it, it's you know in terms of climate change today the the, the 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 communities the cultures the societies which are are receiving the full brunt of the modernist drive to suicide to suicide global suicide are those societies which are suffering which uh, are suffering continuing extraction fossil fuel extraction mining extraction uh, so on which happen to be indigenous societies or you know or traditional subsistence societies globally um and minorities have become subsumed within that i think though they it clearly doesn't apply to you know some of the groups you were talking about within the european context i don't think we have to worry too much about frisians as an example in this context you know they they will be within the context of the netherlands or germany they will be all right but if you are a roma if you are um one of the peoples of the amazon or or part of you know uh, australian or canadian first um, nations i've just been doing a um um a um uh, uh, an exhibition on fossil fuels and I've been trying to pinpoint some of the areas where uh, violence is both implicit and explicit and it's Im it implicit in terms of the mortality of people who are living in the Niger Delta for instance or the Athabasca region of Canada where you know tar sands are being mined uh, in a catastrophic way the result for your community is that you will probably have child mortality at a in a catastrophic sense there'll be fetal abnormalities 
your life expectancy will be very, very low. Um, you know, the violence is, is implicit, it's structural, as much as it is explicit. And I think in those terms, you know, the, the, the ground has shifted. You know, we could have a conversation about minorities in Europe and we could wrap it up in a nice way, bar the Roma and possibly the Sami, but the Sami, I've, as I've already said, there's reasons why they're not likely to be endangered from the politics of society as um, groups once were who were minorities. But I do think that um, the front line is subsistence societies and, uh, and indigenous societies who are feeling the full brunt in, the, in what we, we now call the global south um, in, a, in a really big way. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you mentioned implicit structural violence in frontline communities, and this has immediately made me think of the ongoing pandemic as a contemporary example of global crisis. And here, reports from around the world have revealed that minority groups were in many cases either particularly exposed to the pandemic or scapegoated in response to it. And this is absolutely, as you put it, it's not every minority everywhere, but there were certain frontline communities across the world which were uh, at the front line of, of, of sort of like reactions to the pandemic or um, um, yeah. attempts at scapegoating. And do you think this is indicative of a more generalized minority crisis? Do you think this offers a window into how things will look like when climate catastrophe really turns into catastrophe? Yes. I mean, that's the simple answer. Yes. And you yourself have written about Roma and how Roma have, be, have been exceptionalized in terms of response and you know it does throw us back i mean that, that there's also been the whole conspiracy stuff coming into play about jews and all that which you know drakes us right back to the black death and beyond and um it's sort of interesting how um crisis moments particularly relation in relationship to disease and spreading disease which you can't see have this particular way of um you know bringing out what is meant to be oh impossible and dead under the terms of modernity yet are still somehow there and that is but now to come to the you know this to me i, I what i need to say here is that i don't see covid as exceptional I see it as part and part, you know, COVID to me is again another example of the way that our relationship to nature has become utterly destabilized um, through the way we, you know, our all our agricultural approaches and our urban approaches and to everything. And but COVID is likely to be um, one of many of such factors you know i've always said but you know what will finally kill humanity it will be epidemiological crisis um and you know i don't want to be oh uh you know a, a soothsayer in that in in that way at all but i think it's part and parcel of what is now being called the biogeochemical disruption destabilization of the planet which is now reaching a point beyond which we should have you know we should have stopped decades ago um, and what worries me in these terms is that yes what you call minorities um, which I would agree as well are likely to be on the front line particularly in a in societies which feel entitled to be okay and which are nation states therefore and guarding their sovereignty guarding their territorial integrity uh, I should bring in the word refugees here, of course, because minorities become subsumed within, you know, every day. You know, we're seeing how <coughs> political crisis, one has to bring in the word Afghanistan here, and environmental crisis, they're all coming together. Small groups of people are coming across the channel in, in boats to Britain, and the country is going, you know, the leaders of the country are going ballistic about it. Um, <coughs> But we're talking about the potentiality of millions of people on the move and this will be part of the norm not an aberration but the the reality which we have created and i think in those terms in terms of what i would call states of siege or states of exception 
as will become a permanent state of exception, um, yes, all sorts of groups who are anomalous, unwanted, refugees, asylum seekers, and minorities, and of course those three things can be the same thing, you know, and that's the historic reality as well. I think that will all become um, deafening, actually, and that worries me, and that is why we need to find different, different ways of approaching who we are and what we're doing in this planet, and to to be critical of the of, of the standard 20th century nation state modernist trajectories. And that's that sound those are very big statements which are in themselves a little bit ridiculous, but but I mean it. No, I, I absolutely, I absolutely understand and agree with it. I mean, we know again from from the historical records what the permanent states of exception have produced in the course of the twentieth century, um, and there is definitely reason to worry that, given how much more exponential such states of exception are likely to become because of uh, of the abrupt climate change that um, you know there, there is absolutely a reason to, to to worry about the future in this terms as well so for a final question to, to wrap up our conversation and returning to the climate crisis now this is obviously a global phenomenon one which affects all of humanity albeit as you've mentioned differently and presenting specific challenges in different regions of the world and to different groups and if we are to come back to Eastern Europe, the, the, the location, the geography of our uh, podcast today, what would you say are the specific challenges this region faces when viewed in this perspective um, of climate crisis? Or are there any specific challenges you think it faces? Uh, yeah, well, they're not good. <laughs> um, I think it's, again, one can be regional about this. And I noticed again for to do some of my, to do a little bit of homework, I noticed that there has been a very recent uh, OSCE report on climate change in, particularly in Southeast Europe. And I think one should make, you know, that, 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 that I mean, it, we can see this all around us. We can see this in the year 2021, how if one goes to countries like Greece or Western Turkey or Sicily, and we can think back last year or the year before to, of course, this isn't quite the same arena, but Portugal and Spain, uh, wildfires and how these are now becoming extreme cases. And they, they and that, you know, it is interesting, isn't it, how people with short memories, politicians in particular, they still use these terms one in a one in a lifetime or one in a hundred years. And, you know, any climate scientist work is sought. Her, his or her sort is going to say no sorry that's part of the norm now um and the you know we <coughs> we are on target um in conservative terms i should say this is conservative estimates for a three or four degree rise in temperature above pre-industrial levels if you know anything about about what that means in actual terms this is this is <coughs> This is civilizational breakdown we're talking about here. So, but there is a there is an advance guard of this. Um, you know, uh, uh, the OSCE report specifically talks about um, impacts on certain parts of the Balkans, like the Sava Basin and the Drin Basin, um, as being you know particularly worrying areas where. You know, they talk about it, they talk in the report about it being a threat multiplier. I'd say it's more like an umbrella. And they also talk rather um, nebulously about um, competing political conflicts, I think, you know, for resources. There will be resource issues. And that's, you know, I mean, the background to this really has to be seen in human terms, but forget the extreme weather oscillations of which there will be many more which will bring death with them we're talking about societies which produce food within parametric conditions and you take away those parametric conditions if you can't grow cereals if the ground underneath desiccates and the soil has already been destroyed through a particular form of modernist farming you're going to have mass starvation um, now Yes, I think certain areas, particularly in the south southeastern Europe, are 
canaries they are the indicators of how this is going to happen and can we conceive of people from greece turkey in addition to people from drought ridden afghanistan and iran and whatever heading into europe into you know i mean we had syria um in 2012-13 you know can one imagine what it will mean in terms of impact um, upon, as you said, the anxiety, the Western European anxiety about containing this. It will be uncontainable. It will be uncontainable. So the big picture is one of what are we going to do about climate change to take us off this particular modernist, globalizing, consumerist trajectory? You know, the commodification of everything. We have to we have to go back, to, we have to change to a different way of looking at the world and our place in it before it's too late. And yes, there is a specific European dimension to that, though I think it has to be put in terms of what is happening in other parts of the world. And to, and, you know, to go back to the old environmental way of looking at things, to thinking globally, but acting locally. Thank you very much, Mark. I mean, that's not it's not exactly a happy picture that we're concluding on or a happy prospect for the for the immediate future. But there's also hope, at least youth seem to think there is, that we, we can still change things before it's too late. So I guess that's something we can also leave uh, our audience with. Um, I would like to thank you once again for agreeing to um, to be part of this series and to have this conversation this afternoon about minorities, um, Eastern Europe, and um, the various contexts starting from the late 19th century through um, the First World War, the Second World War, bringing it up today and the challenges the climate crisis poses to societies in Eastern Europe and beyond, and to minority groups in Eastern Europe and beyond. So I'd like to thank you very much. And with this, I would uh, pass the mic back to our host, Olena. Raul, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure talking with you and also to Elena for making this happen. Thank you. Thank you both. This, this has been a fantastic conversation and I'm sure that, that, that it provides a lot of food for thoughts for our audience. Thank you.